One side is largely proclaiming that a climate emergency needs to be declared. The global economy either needs to be heavily hamstrung or shut down entirely to save the planet. And this is normally accompanied by very short deadlines in which this activity needs to occur. The Australian contribution to this claimed emergency is a large part of the problem and that the response should start by the abolition of the coal industry to be replaced by a mix of wind and solar, perhaps with batteries to provide any needed stability. The cost has largely seemed to be irrelevant. The other side has also been making noises that amount to everything from denials that this has been happening to assertions that CO2 is a needed plant food and therefore beneficial, that we're in a brutal and punishing ice age and that any observed warming is just solar driven. And besides, the solution to the problem, which may or may not exist, is to build more nuclear power plants rather than more whirling bird choppers and covering more fields with bird cookers. Fortunately, there are several voices that bring some reality into this discussion and, they're, and, they're, and are more, prepared, more than prepared to debate and discuss in a sensible and fact-based way. I will hand over shortly to our esteemed panellists to give their perspectives. First up will be Stefan Venber. He has a background as a manager in the publishing industry, primarily magazines, where he launched several new magazines and also in books, including paperbacks on a mass scale and some very large book clubs. Having worked internationally in cross-national publishing, he's also been involved in a couple of fairly recent startups. The last part of his career was with the Swedish Taxpayers Group, which has been built to over 180,000 members and one of the most influential organisations in Sweden. The Swedish Taxpayers Group has also managed to change or get rid of the real estate and the capital tax, which together were pushing especially older people out of their homes. Since retiring, he has continued on several boards and was also, was also in the period 2014 to 2016 chairman and president of the World Taxpayers Association. And for those that are familiar with the Socialist Republic, sorry, the, the uh, constitutional monarchy of Sweden, getting tax changes made there is an uphill battle. Stefan. My first claim to fame in this uh, area is from, goes back to 1972 when there was a first Stockholm uh, conference on the climate and uh, an American friend of mine and I, uh, he, he was from Alaska and they, he wanted to stop the whaling, okay. So we got together and we got the whole hippie protester camp uh, outside Stockholm in an old airfield to make some, decorate their buses uh, with black plastic so they looked like sort of supposed to look like whales and we had them parade through Stockholm and a year after that all the whaling was stopped so I maybe had a little part in that probably not very big but anyway um, and I got a serious interest in this whole climate thing uh, let's say in the early uh, mid 90s and I, I felt uh, well give it 10 years and uh, uh, the reality will dawn on everybody and the whole issue will die down but on the, con the, co the opposite has happened. Um, and then I've understood that there are some big uh, economic forces behind this driving this, and that has led me now to uh, publishing of a book called uh, Rockefeller, a climate, St climate Smart Story, on 400 pages, which a friend of mine has written, and I've co-published that, and that's uh, just come out in Swedish, and I hope to have it in English in uh, six months or so. Anyway, th this leads me to the Paris Agreement, and I will try to um, uh, in 10 minutes to tell you all you need to know about the Paris Agreement. Now this was uh, in uh, 2015 and uh, I read the Paris Agreement three times so that's another claim to fame. <laughs> all uh, 28, 35 pages and uh, I was wondering what, what is the, all this about? It's a lot of bureaucratic language but actually what it is understood it's like, a bit like going to school and you you're setting up plans, targets, uh, and control systems. And uh, much of it is sort of softly underneath uh, exchange of technology, where you give away your technology, set up plans and targets, and then the follow-up on uh, the plans and targets. And every year you're supposed to report to your principal how you're doing. Uh, and every five years there will be a big exam. And if you're not living up to uh, your promises and uh, the plans that are put down, you will be uh, rebated and they will say yeah, we need, you need to have new plans which are better plans. So um, the first, first uh, check-off time, the first graduation period is in 2023 
And uh, there's a big chance, I think, that all the students will flunk. <laughs> no one will pass. <coughs> and so how do you, how do you push, put, point this? Nothing happening? Yeah. We'll do it here. Yeah. Oh, I did it. OK. <laughs> so, oh, well. <laughs> OK. There's three times and it works. OK, so the plan is, uh, the idea is to, to reduce emissions by 70% by 2013, and uh, all emissions should be offset by 2050. Um, and uh, this means that uh, we should stop selling all BMWs uh, immediately because they will last more than 20 years. Troy has one which is 30, I think. Some, some 20 years, okay. Um, I have an old Rover which is running into its 20th year. Um, so, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a Swedish target. That targets are a bit different from country to country. And they're similar, but all should be, be reached is by 2050. And uh, there's something here called Annex 2. Let's see if we can switch. Where do I point? Hmm? Just click on your screen. Just, there we go. Yeah. Uh, besides the actual ag agreement, there's a book of rules and, and an ambi ambition cycle. There's planning, communication, execution, reporting, evaluation, correction, and so on. Uh, and flexible but clear targets. And this is now, this is a sh sharp stuff, which uh, is built on the actual agreement, which lays down the principles of all this. to find where, where am I? We'll do this. There we go. Just delays, that's all. Okay, this is our <coughs> Swedish uh, Minister of Climate signing off for Sweden, uh, actually making the Paris Agreement into a law in Sweden, which is it's not really uh, otherwise necessarily a law. Uh, and it's a bit takeoff on some of the pictures of D Donald Trump signing stuff with uh, just men around him. And we have a feminist government, so we have all the women around there. And to be better than everybody else, we're going to be climate neutral by 2045, believe it or not. Now, uh, the, the idea part of this is setting up a big 100 billion US dollar fund, uh, 100 billion US dollars every year. It's a lot of money. And this will then be collected in a uh, South Korea, where they're setting up an administration in this new city, uh, 60 kilometers south of Seoul. And it will all go in there, and it will be, the administration is totally uh, protected from outside, total um, uh, immunity from any uh, looking in on it. And the money is to be sent here uh, without assign assigning to anything specific, because it's considered to be kind of fine for all the uh, pollution we've done through the years, all our technical development. Then to understand uh, the Paris Agreement, this is really a key picture. There's something called Annex 2 on the left there. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Norway, Sweden, and in the European Union. There's 26 countries. Uh, these are the 26 countries. We're going to pay for the whole thing. Everybody else is going to be receiving money. So if you have 196 countries who have signed to this, 26 countries are on the paying end, and 170 countries are on the receiving end. So that's uh, why there's such an enthusiasm among the, the poorer countries. The countries on the right are the uh, Annex 1 countries, and the other ones who, if they behave well, can graduate up into the ca Annex 2 category and also be allowed to pay. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Um, let's go on. Oh, I have such trouble with this thing. There we go. Oops, no back. Too much. Now, uh, how much is this um, uh, per country? Uh, I think I'm the only one who's made a calculation of what 100 billion means for each of these 26 countries. Uh, the um, uh, top, the United States, they were going to pay 40% of this, these 100 billion. And when, and when Donald Trump saw this, he immediately left the Paris Agreement. Um, so. Going down, it's including the U.S. and on the right without the U.S. Because now they're saying, okay, we, the rest will have to compensate for the lack of the money from the United States because we do need 100 billion. So you go down, uh, Japan, 17 billion, Germany, almost 14 billion, U.K., 10 billion, uh, France, 9.75, and so on down. Uh, Australia, 
4.995 billion US dollars every year for you Aussies to send to Korea. Isn't that great? <laughs> to save the climate. We go down to Sweden, it's about 2 billion um, in the right column. Now 2 billion, that's roughly what our police force costs every year. It costs about 2.2. It's half of our military cost. Uh, and it's about 40% of our foreign aid budget. Just to put this in, in perspective, it's a heck of a lot of money every year. Now this is an example. Uh, you, a UN Green Climate Fund was set up uh, in, decided in 2009 and set up in 2015. And it was operational, or it was operational in 2015. And this is also then administrated in South Korea. And the same organization will administrate the uh, uh, Paris, Paris family. And on the right is how much this is per person. And you see Sweden, $61 per person. OK, we paid up. We promised, promised 61, we paid 61. Uh, most of the other countries uh, are in the $10 range. Norway is uh, 25, uh, UK 11. And the middle column is then what they've actually paid. And, and uh, one of the last things Obama uh, did uh, three days before he left as president, he sent $500 million into this fund. And this was a one-time shot. And it now has $5 billion, and they're starting to spend a little bit on it. So then, how realistic is all this? Uh, we can see how uh, the OECD and non-OECD uh, countries, uh, the, pr the projection for emissions, uh, OECD is rather very flat, and you see the non-OECD countries just going up the sky. Uh, now, why is this? Um, the Paris Agreement also means that the um, non-Annex II countries, they can keep on expanding their uh, emissions at a rate of 60% of their growth in, in a, a gross natural product. So for China and India and many of these countries, they can just keep on doing exactly what they're doing. And that's the effect of that. Uh, then here's a, uh, the, ex the expected growth in energy to uh, 2040, and you see going down how much will still be coal. Uh, the biggest one will still be oil. This is then including uh, car, gasoline, everything, all energy. Uh, ga oil, gas, uh, then we have coal. Then comes, uh, uh, well, you have nuclear with just uh, one billion. It's less than, uh, it's about six, seven percent. And bioenergy is coming up a bit. And other renewables is, includes wind and solar power. So it will still be quite small. Oops, still get not get. There we go. This is then making this as a pie, 2016. Uh, solar power and wind, 0.8 percent in the world. And uh, by 2040, which we were looking at, where we're going to be, uh, have reduced most of this, uh, wind and solar will be 3.6 percent. Go again. I do it. There we go. OK. Um, electric cars. Um, all of the, in all of the EU now, we have 0.8 percent, um, mostly non-chargeable hybrids, that is a Prius, you know, where the, the generation that goes back into the batteries. Um, and new, new sales in 2018 in Sweden was 88% 8, 8 chargeable cars, um, mostly the hybrids with run both on batteries and on gasoline. And as soon as they leave the city, they are running on gasoline. And by 2030, it will be a third of the fleet, roughly. See. This is a projection of uh, uh, chargeable cars in Sweden. We're at 2022, you see going up. So by 2030, uh, they will be about roughly a third of the, of the fleet. Now, the, then there is a cost in lost economic growth, and that's been expected, calculated uh, to 2 billion US dollars per year by not being able to be efficient. Now, fully implemented, will meet about, this will meet about 1% of the need that IPCC uh, estimates that we need. Let me see, I can change it. 
Anyway, final slide, the big winners in all this is China and Russia, not surprisingly. China is a huge winner in this whole uh, Paris Agreement. That's important to know when the Chinese are proud of all their uh, wind power installations and so on. They, will, they have 95% control of the uh, rare earth metal, metals in the world, which, uh, which are like 50 pounds in a Prius. It's the metal, it's the stuff you need for the gener very strong magnets in the generators. And uh, they also manufacture the solar power things, they manufacture the wind turbines, uh, about 60% of that market. Russia is also a good size winner with the gas that they're pump starting to pump into uh, Western Europe to have a control eventually of the energy supply in Europe. That's my last point, thank you. Next up is Nick Minchin. Those of us who have any interest at all in Australian politics will remember Nick as a former Liberal Senator for South Australia, pardon me, and Howard Government Cabinet Minister, where he had three separate ministerial positions. First as Special Minister of State, the next Minister for Industry, Science and Resources, and lastly as Minister for Finance and Administration, a position he held until the election of 2007. After leaving Parliament in 2010, he was appointed Australian Consul General in New York and is currently the Chairman of Responsible Wagering Australia and member of the Foreign Investment Review Board. Nick was educated at the ANU where he gained degrees in, laws, in law and economics. Nick will be discussing the political implication for energy and climate policy flowing from the Coalition's return to government at the recent election. I, I first want to take the, this opportunity uh, to pay tribute to one of the victims of last weekend's so-called climate change election, uh, my good friend Tony Abbott. Uh, and I think it's appropriate I do so uh, at this forum as the left of Australian politics of course claim that his defeat was a result of his dreadful climate denialism. Um, but in my view Tony is an absolute giant of Australian politics and a staunch and fearless advocate of conservatism whatever the price he might have to pay. And for those of us who are Liberals, we need to remember he is one of only four Liberals to lead the party from opposition into government since the party was formed. And he went on, of course, to become our 28th Prime Minister. So I think everybody on the centre-right of Australian politics should pay homage to the enormous contribution that he's made to our cause, and I'm sorry to see him go. Uh, it was my privilege as the then Coalition Senate leader in 2009 uh, to join with Tony in preventing the implementation of Kevin Rudd's uh, then proposed carbon pollution reduction scheme legislation, a, a big ETS in disguise. And uh, as you may recall, Tony and I both resigned from Malcolm Turnbull's shadow cabinet uh, in protest over Mr Turnbull's absolute determination to ensure that the then coalition opposition fully supported uh, Labor's so-called CPRS legislation. Uh, that all ended up, of course, in Tony replacing Mr Turnbull as the uh, Liberal leader, uh, and of course the defeat uh, of that legislation, um, one of Tony's crowning achievements. Um, Tony, like me, has been steadfast in his scepticism of the theory of anthropogenic global warming, and I guess last weekend he paid a pretty high price for his resolute honesty. And the campaign waged against him is something the like of which we've never seen in Australian politics. A full court press to remove Mr Abbott from public life in this country. Uh, but if, as the left in Australia do claim, it was the so-called climate change election, then I think, without question, climate change hysteria was the big loser. I mean, Labor took to that election the most extreme climate change policy it could, uh, an election everyone expected it to win, and of course it lost. Uh, and I think Labor did lose for many reasons, but partly because Australians did reject a radical um, policy on carbon dioxide emissions that would have cost absolute billions, cost jobs, hurt the poorest working families in Australia while achieving absolutely nothing. And I, uh, the, the full Im implementation of this extreme, really extreme policy, of course, would not have made any difference whatsoever to average global temperatures. It would have made no difference to the frequency or severity of 
droughts or floods or other extreme weather events in Australia. And, and the worst part of the Labor campaign was the extraordinary arrogance it displayed in dismissing all questions about the, the cost of the policy. It dismissed them in the words of Bill Shorten as dumb and dishonest. Uh, and it was, of course, the policy itself that was dumb and dishonest. Um, and, you know, one of the worst moments in the campaign was when that loyal public servant, Brian Fisher, who had the guts to put on the record the real cost of both the Coalition's policy, but well, particularly Labor's policy, and um, his house and home address was then publicised and his house egg-bombed. And he was he, in an attempt to drive him out of the public debate as well. So uh, while it seems that Australian voters, and I think we have to accept this, want Australia to play its part in controlling carbon dioxide emissions, they're clearly not prepared to sign a blank cheque to achieve it. And I think that's the major lesson from this campaign, and I hope it's a lesson the Labor Party learns. So I, I think we should all be grateful for the pragmatism displayed by the Australian people uh, last weekend in rejecting the overt climate change hysteria which surrounded the Labor Party and Greens campaigns. So where do we go from here on, on energy and climate now that the uh, coalition's been re-endorsed, uh, you know, re-elected? I think we have to accept that the Australian people, by doing so, have endorsed the coalition policy, which is to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 26% on 2005 levels by 2030, in line with the, uh, the government's Paris uh, Agreement commitments. And uh, it's open to you to question why the government would want to commit to those agreement, that agreement in light of the presentation we've just heard. Um, but it, it's worth noting, and many commentators have noticed this, that by so doing, Australia is committing to the biggest per capita reductions in carbon dioxide emissions of any developed country on the planet. Um, and the government now has a range of programs to achieve this target. Uh, fortunately, from our point of view, without imposing a carbon tax or an emissions trading scheme. It's still, of course, got the renewable energy target, embarrassingly first introduced uh, by the Howard government at a very modest 2%. But once you introduce things, they're very hard to get rid of. And of course, now it's exploded. And that objective now is to have 23.5% of our energy supplied by renewables by 2020. And the rate at, at which people are installing solar panels will probably get there. Uh, the government is investing billions upon billions into its so-called battery of the nation, uh, or otherwise Snowy 2.0, as our former Prime Minister used to like to call it, which, as you all know, is a, just a massive pumped hydro scheme. Um, so, stepping back a bit, against the backdrop of what has been an absolute disaster over the last 15 years in energy policy in Australia, uh, during which governments of both sides, frankly, have destroyed what I loudly proclaimed as the then Minister for Industry, Science and Resources, was the world, developed world's cheapest, most reliable electricity system, uh, with what is, has been a mad rush to windmills and solar panels, uh, what else should the government now be doing? Well, in my view, the government has to be absolutely relentless in its determination to get our state governments to remove their unbelievably insane prohibitions on gas exploration and developed. I relocated from the crazy state of South Australia, an international embarrassment in relation to energy, uh, to the state of Victoria, which has a prohibition on even exploration on the mainland. Of Victoria, it's unbelievable. Um, I think the government should overtly champion the development of fracking in Australia, which of course has done so much to make the USA the champion of cheap, reliable, lower emissions energy on the, on the planet. And I think our government really does in this term have to bite the bullet on nuclear energy. Uh, it should champion new generation nuclear power as a key part of our future energy mix. And there's very exciting things happening in relation to the development of nuclear energy. Uh, the government should remove the legislative prohibition on the development of nuclear power in Australia, a uh, legislative prohibition embarrassingly put in place by the Howard government of which I was a member. Uh, and if anybody wants to ask me about that in question time, they can. But I, I think the government, what it can do in a, a very positive fashion 
is seek to put in place the legislative and regulatory framework to allow nuclear power industry to become a reality in this country, which, as we all know, actually has the world's biggest uranium reserves. Um, and, uh, and lastly, and in conclusion, I think all coalition MPs should continue to remind themselves uh, and the Australian people of some basic facts about our climate. The fact that carbon dioxide comprises a mere 0.04 per cent of the atmosphere, that carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, pollutant, and the thing that makes me more angry than anything is people talking about carbon pollution. It is a clear, odourless gas vital to life on Earth. The Coalition MP should remind Australians that human activity is responsible for only 3 per cent of all global CO2 emissions, and it was pointed out to me before the start of this thing that a volcano went off in Bali apparently yesterday, and of course vol volcanoes pump unbelievable amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere that dwarf human emissions. Uh, they should remind themselves and the public that Australia is responsible for only 1.3 per cent of that 3 per cent of all humanity's CO2 emissions. Uh, you know, 98 per cent come from somewhere else. And that currently just the annual increase in China's carbon dioxide emissions exceed the total of Australian carbon dioxide emissions. And these are all things that I don't think the Australian people actually know. Um, and they need to keep saying that nothing, absolutely nothing Australia does will make any difference whatsoever to the world's climate. We can shut the joint down tomorrow and it'll make no difference to the world's climate, let alone to the frequency or severity of uh, weather events. They should remind themselves and the Australian people that of course the climate is changing. It always has, it always will, but the role of human activity remains in scientific dispute and is yet unproven. And of course, the left have changed their, uh, their language on this stuff. Now we talk about, the left talk about a climate emergency, a climate crisis. That has to be confronted. There is no climate emergency. There is no climate crisis. The world is not going to end in 12 years' time. Um, and I think that the one thing that government has really, really got to focus on is to remind the people and themselves that their greatest responsibility to the Australian people as a government is to ensure that all Australians have access to affordable, reliable, 24-7 electricity. Thank you. Before I introduce our final speaker, I'd like to uh, emphasise the fact that, particularly given the heat that comes from the debate on both sides, I will only be accepting answers, uh, questions through the Hoover Act. Uh, through the Hoover Act, let's get it right. Um, and they must be in the form of questions. If you want to make comments, that's great. Make them as long as you want, but I won't be reading them from here. So finally, Jo Nova. Jo received a Bachelor of Science First Class from the University of Western Australia. She received a Grad Cert in Scientific Communication from the ANU in 18, uh, correction, 1989, and she did Honours Research in 1990. For three years, she was an Associate Lecturer of Science Communication at the ANU, and for four years after that, jointly coordinated the Shell Questacon Science Circus. She was the host of the first series of Australian children's science television show and worked on Space Cadets, a science fiction show by Foxtel. She's the author of a 16-page illustrated text called The Skeptic's Handbook, and in 2009, she issued a sequel, Global Bullies Want Your Money. And in the same year, she wrote a paper for the SPPI entitled Climate Money. I think it sounds like it's echoing a lot of what Stefan said earlier. Jo has also written for The Spectator and has had columns published on the op-ed pages of The Australian on Journalism, Public Spending, Free Markets and Politics. Jo. Thank you. And I'd like to start by thanking CFACT in the US because they helped to get me here. They're the people who produced Climate Hustle. So you can come and find me afterwards if you want to get a copy of Climate Hustle or the Skeptic's Handbook, which we've got both versions of here as well this afternoon. So uh, see me at the desk around the corner later. Now, here's hoping that this, um, I can manage the complicated remote here. Now, I know you think I'm here to talk about energy, but really I'm here to warn you that there are pagan druids amongst us. They are building temples and they're quite open about it. It's not hidden. So I'm here to discuss the rise of pagan druids. 
Now, here's a sacred shield coming up, this one. <laughs> it's a shield for the Great Barrier Reef to protect it from acidity and temperature rises. It's also protecting us from eagles. They get fried sometimes. Now, these totems, uh, they are designed to slow storms down <laughs> in a hundred years' time. And this would be the onshore version of those kind of totems. And we've seen the, uh, sorry, that was the onshore, the offshore version. And these are the burning incense version. <laughs> That one not being as good at stopping bats and birds as the ones that work, but... So, say, the, since then, I spoke a year ago on how to destroy Australia's electricity grid. Sadly, the government it took my advice. Since then, our intermittent unreliable might not be there when you need it. Generating capacity has grown not by 5%, not by 7%, but by 50% in a year. That's five zero, fifty percent more intermittent unreliable renewables than we had a year ago. We have a 56,000 gigawatt grid. That's our total kind of capacity of that. A year ago, it was four gigawatts of renewables. That's become six gigawatts of renewables. It's still small compared to the total generating capacity, but you don't need many unreliable renewables to make the whole thing awkward. So, say hello, Australians here, your renewable crash test dummies. We are installing renewables faster than anywhere, and to give you some idea of just how fast we're installing renewables, and I think these ones are designed to stop fish being reckless and to save octopuses from going blind. <laughs> I'm serious, these are the claims, and crocodiles may come further south. How many solar panels is it gonna take for us to stop crocodiles coming <laughs> south? Why don't we survey the Australian public and ask them what they think? How many wind farms does it take to stop a flood in Bangladesh? I don't think the Australian people are gonna fall for that, are they? But that's what they're asking us to do, to join the ends of the debate. CO2 is a problem, build your, what is the aim of these? To reduce CO2, and what's the problem with CO2? Well, it does all sorts of horrible things, like, slight warming that brings the crocodiles down and the sharks attack more and the octopus go blind and the fish get reckless and the little fluffy things are all suffering. It's terrible. So how fast is it happening in Australia? Well, this is quite a scary graph. This is solar PV installations. That starts off in about the year 2001 and goes to October last year. Look at the curve there. We're in a death spiral in terms of solar PV installations. Now they argue that that makes it a success. Everybody wants solar. What they're not saying is half the cost of those solar panels has been subsidised by other electricity users, most of whom don't realise they're subsidising it, and that the people picking up solar are doing it because they're so sick of paying for other people's solar panels and really expensive bills, they have to get solar to try and bring the bill down, which makes the burden worse on everyone else. Hence the death spiral. We're in a positive feedback loop and I can't see any end to this, and if the whole nation gets solar panels, we'll all be poor. Who's going to pay? So last year, our intermittent renewables grew by 50%. And remember, this was achieved under a government accused of doing nothing, under a conservative government, and who has no climate policy. And yet, we're increasing renewables at such an extraordinary rate. Here are Australian, that, that starts off in uh, the latest year is 2019, that biggest lump. 2018 was the year before, 2017 was the year before, and 16 and whatnot. Let's just compare our, this is per capita. Remember, per capita is really important in this debate and it's often not mentioned. So the annual rate of per capita renewables deployment, compare us to the rest of the world, you can see how far ahead we're getting. We are way out, when I say renewable crash test dummies, we're the only ones in the race. It's not a race we want to win and we're totally doing it. Per capita, we're installing unreliable generators more than twice as fast as Germany and four to five times faster per capita than the EU, USA, Japan and China. That is a Blake et al. ANU study this year. The whole debate should be over. That came out in March. Where does everyone go, oh, okay, hang on, we're doing more than our fair share, it's time to pause. You know, just stop, just stop, just say no. So thus, the largest coal exporter in the world is working hard 
to destroy its largest export earning industry, which would be noble if only there was more to it than being a magical spell to ward off storms. We're back to the witchcraft, yes. But, you know, there are other things to consider. Oh, yes, <laughs> the challenge for us to be at the head of the renewables race includes the fact that we are the largest exporter in coal. So that's primary coal exports in 2015. We are the red one. Indonesia's second and no one else really quite counts. We export a lot of coal mostly because we dig up a lot, but we don't use it. To put that in perspective, China digs up seven to ten times as much coal as we do, and they use it all themselves. They are not sending their coal overseas. The only reason we're the biggest is because we don't use as much as we can dig up. We also um, have a lead in uranium. We are the top one on the end there. Sorry, I'll just put that into perspective so you can see our uranium resources. <laughs> now, 451 nuclear reactors around the world and we have none of them, not power generating reactors. And thorium, we don't even talk about thorium. What's the point? We also happen to lead that, or that might be an old number now, but at the time we were the leaders in thorium. Most Australians probably couldn't pronounce it. It's not part of our discussion. But, you know, who needs a thorium reactor? Well, India, China, and I think Norway are looking at thorium. They don't have as much uranium as us. But in any case, all these resources, we are, must be God's gift to resources and Fittingly, we had the lowest, this is like Australia, 1995, cheap electricity. We are like fourth on the bottom of the graph there in terms of electricity. Well, we had to change that. So we did now scoring high in electricity prices. And you can see down the bottom, there's a whole bunch of loser countries down here who just haven't got their act together with electricity prices. We can study what they do, but essentially they run off nukes or coal or <coughs> shale. Up here, all of these are running pagan uh, institutions trying to change the weather with their electricity grid. Now, don't forget, blackouts can be fun. And, uh, you know, it's a therapy for screen addicted kids. Sometimes blackouts are fun and we find out nine months later. Great for observing stars, especially with radio telescopes powered by wood. And it's the only, this is the best thing about a black ass, the only 100% effective antidote to the ABC. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So welcome to modern Australia, where our grid winds through 40,000 kilometres over mountains and under the Bass Strait, and it's effectively managed by a form of witchcraft. Instead of sacrificing goats and throwing spears at the moon and running naked through the street, we turn our coal industrial generators into weather controlling machines and we wonder why that's expensive. How to destroy your grid? Step one in destroying a grid is to take your industrial capacity that took a generation to build and pay off and not demand it's used for electricity, but demand that its first priority is to make the weather nicer, to slow storms, to stop floods and droughts at the same time. So we want less of that and more of another one. And the, uh, yes, that's, you think it's an industrial energy plant. Actually, it is a global climate controller, like an air conditioner for the planet. Well, this one's a bad one. It's heating the planet, apparently. Step two, if you want to change the climate, don't pick a sensible way to do it. Pick the worst way possible, which is solar and wind. They're hideously expensive. We're talking hundreds of dollars per tonne of carbon saved. If you worried about carbon, if you're an environmentalist, then you'd have to hate the environment to pick solar as a way of trying to change the weather. Tony Abbott's direct action plan still beats all of the others at a mere $14 a tonne of carbon saved. He used a free market approach. It worked and it's so much cheaper. Any serious environmentalist should be really applauding Tony Abbott. He did an amazing job with that. And what do you know? I think the Labor Party is considering picking it up. Yeah. Yes. So Tony Abbott's still running national energy policy, even though they supposedly hate him. Uh, that's wind power in an average month, any month. Pick a month, uh, it comes and goes. And there is the big problem with intermittent supplies. On any day, that's twice a month, only 3%. And that's the entire eastern seaboard of wind generators. So that means most of the time it's working, but you can never guarantee it's gonna work. It's like having a spare car in the garage, which has free fuel, fantastic, free fuel. 
but it, it might not work on any given day. So you've got to have a backup car and you've got to use the backup car three quarters of the time but now you need an extra garage. So you've lost some land space, you've got to pay for the garage, you've got to pay the cars and maintenance, the rego, all the other costs. So we save on fuel and we lose on everything else. And people wonder why we're not saving money. Yeah, well, free fuel is only one part of the whole big kit. Here is a standard weather pattern in Australia. All of those wind turbines on the eastern seaboard all stop at once because we get these high pressure cells and the wind stops everywhere on the east. So it doesn't matter how many we install, there's still going to be days when there's no wind. It, you know, and likewise, it happens with clouds too. There's a system here with clouds running up and down almost all of the solar panels on the eastern seaboard. When that happens, a gigawatt of energy just is gone, just goes. You know, people talk about old unreliable coal, but it's not like this, where even at a supposedly best hour at midday, it could just be, well, you know, absent. All right, and step three, of course, you need big government to truly destroy an electricity grid. You can't do it with individual state governments. You have to combine it so that you can put people like this lady in charge. <laughs> Audrey Zimmerman, a, uh, a lawyer from New York, was handpicked by Turnbull. She was going to be, we hear, on the Hillary team. And then I guess she needed a job in 2017, and thanks to Turnbull, she got one. Managing our grid. She has said wonderful things like, I believe we're the last generation on earth who can really do something about climate change and your electricity bills are doing that. Yes, achieving nothing. Technology, she says, has changed and resisting this change is a little like trying to resist the internet. And we can all remember, can't we, when the internet started, how the government needed to subsidise us to make us use the damn thing to make sure it got off the ground? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like mobile phones, we were all forced to use them. Sure. All right, well, I clearly could go on and on and on, and I don't have time to. So um, perhaps I should finish with just pointing out that supposedly we've had bipartisan disagreement and stagnation and nothing on climate change in Australia, but there you have our renewable energy target, and it's rising under both kinds of governments relentlessly year after year after year. And they say they want policy certainty, and they've had it all along. Every year, relentlessly increasing. We have to do this mandated by law, and that that is called no action, and called no target, and called disagreement. These people are gaslighting us, ladies and gentlemen. Black is white, up is down. You can't have a sensible conversation in this country. And the only thing I disagree with Nick on is to say, there's never been a debate, Nick. We've never had a debate in this country. So um, have I uh, run out of time completely, blown it away, or I can? You can go for wish. So some of my other 130 slides, maybe. Um, <laughs> I'll just show you my favourites. Now, unfortunately, intermittent generation, people don't understand. It works like a vandal on the whole system. And they talk costs and they say solar is now cheaper than coal. But what they don't tell you is a lot of the costs are hidden. And a lot of the costs that are being added to coal are actually because of the intermittent supplier. And studies in the US show that uh, gas power goes up by $30 a megawatt hour. If you tie a gas plant to a wind farm, if you run it on its own, it's cheaper. And if you run it tied to a gas plant, sorry, to wind farms, it's working less of the time, but it needs to charge more for the time that it does run. Is that a shock? Because it's got the same capital costs, it's got the same maintenance, the staff. You know, these people are sitting around there waiting while the wind blows, just, I don't know, watching cat videos on YouTube or something while they wait for the wind to stop blowing and they need gas again. The costs to the company don't go down much slightly less fuel and slightly more in nearly everything else. And maintenance costs often go up. It's like running a car in the city instead of the country. Those coal generators, they're designed to run flat tack at just 90%, 95% day in, day out, year after year. Hazelwood, when it closed, was 53 years old and it was selling electricity at $30 a megawatt hour, which translated to an electricity bill is three cents a kilowatt hour and we're paying about 28 cents a kilowatt hour on our bills. So that was 53 years old, old coal. I'm sure they were showing off, but nonetheless, they, um, those coal plants are an incredible asset. 
And uh, oh yeah, step four, you've got to cripple the free market. It will thwart you at every step if you try and make electricity expensive because everyone wants cheap electricity. So you've got to forbid them from buying it. So what you mustn't ever do is link up like those evil coal plants directly with houses. You've got to put it through a national system where people are forbidden from buying stuff direct. They have to go through the AEMO and others and pay other costs and whatnot. And a Chinese group did do this direct and they got a deal with a coal plant in New South Wales a year or two ago for eight cents a kilowatt hour. That's because they were within, the, they found a loophole, they built their, their plant right next to a coal plant, therefore they're not on the national grid, they're just going direct. They're within a kilometre, there's some rule like that. So a local news agency 20 k's away was paying 28 cents a kilowatt hour and the Chinese were able to do a deal to run their Bitcoin servers or whatever uh, for eight cents off the same coal-fired plant. So crypto from China can get a cheap deal in Australia, but Australians in Australia can't. It shows you how cheap electricity could be if we really tried hard. And those are kind of prices the US is paying for electricity still, because they are not beholden to the same strange religion that we are. Now this is a graph I really like. It's about uh, lifetime costs of coal and it's a US study. So this is the capital cost, the red bit. So you got to, you build a plant, it takes 30 years. So a plant is born there, year zero. By the time the plant is 30 years old, it's grown up, we've paid off its debt. Now the price of electricity it provides is about $30 a megawatt hour. And it can continue on theoretically indefinitely. Like an old car, you just keep replacing the bits. There's no reason we have to stop coal plants at 50 years. One of the guys put in an offer to extend it to 70 in New South Wales. They privately own it and they're quite happy to do that. So old coal plants don't have to die, they can go on forever producing cheap electricity. So they are arguably great national institutions. So what do we do with a great national institution? We blow it up. <laughs> yes, South Australia, Port Augusta, ladies and gentlemen. That's what you do and I'll finish up with this you can see here, this is a graph that goes back 50 years, I think. Falling electricity prices as thousands of engineers around Australia worked really hard over the decades to make our system efficient. Those coal turbines weigh 600 tonnes. They spin at 3,000 times per minute. That's an incredible amount of stable inertia on our electricity grid, keeping the frequency nice and constant, which is what you want out of electricity, not the lumpy kind that comes and goes. And we had it worked out and we had cheap electricity in 1995 with lots of coal-fired power. Now we still have lots of coal-fired power but we've added a few renewables. What a coincidence, there's the renewables coming in and the carbon tax and now things are just going off the map. So on the last graph, this is death to the whole argument I reckon if I can get this last graph to show. No, it's not happy, which way am I supposed to point? Sorry, I'm keeping you in suspense. Maybe you should press it, Stephen. How do I get that no, next graph? Um, it looked like the arrow. Yes. Uh, did it? Yeah. Brilliant. It's the other way okay, around. for the last graph, this line here compares countries all around the world. It shows that the more renewables you have, the more you pay for electricity. So when someone says renewables are cheap, I say name the country that has a lot of renewables and cheap electricity. And the only countries they can name are ones with hydro. And you say name the country with low emissions and cheap electricity, and it's France, because it's 70% nuclear. There are no countries on earth that have lots of wind and solar and cheap electricity. And there's the graph, and we're up there now. Yay! Renewable crash test dummies winning the race to nowhere. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.